China draws new territorial claims around the South China Sea, the Indian borders, and Russia. They drew 10 dashed lines to include Taiwan. Meanwhile, Xi Jinping is afraid to show his faith at G20 this month. Welcome to China Insider, I'm David Zhang. When there is a crisis in China, the CCP diverts attention by making troubles outside. In a newly released so-called China Standard Map, they've decided to include a few very controversial and illegal claims. Now, this in fact reflects the diplomatic crisis in the CCP. They've decided to abandon the nice mask and show their real intentions. One is the addition of another dashed line, marking 10 dashes in the South China Sea. Now, the new line draws Taiwan and the West Philippine Sea into the so-called claim of sovereignty by the Chinese Communist Party. The Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Taiwan have criticized and opposed such claim. Now, China's previous nine dash line claims that everything in the South China Sea belongs to China, and it's illegal. Now, it's this new addition to the areas around Taiwan and the Philippines, it's another provocation, and the claim is deliberately ambiguous and has never actually been explicitly made by the CCP as to what exactly the nine dash line or now the 10 dash line represents. It's a gray zone activity. They leave it blank, which means it's illegal but not enough to be considered a military confrontation. To avoid confusion, basically what the CCP views as their own domestic sovereign sea area is illegal to the rest of the world. But because the communists in Beijing don't care, they made up their own pseudo-strategic narratives, making illegal claims and justifying them through legal warfare. Now, legal or law warfare is the use or misuse of legislation. In the case of the CCP, it's creating laws that, or in the case of the South China Sea, making up fake claims that are so-called rooted in Chinese laws. But these laws aren't recognized by the rest of the world. By exerting influence through entertainment, mass media, and sheer military involvement, the situation in the South China Sea is one of salami slicing. Basically, they've been able to tiny pieces or slices by slices to get things done, including making these man-made islands. But the new inclusion around Taiwan is a process to justify the invasion. It's now being worded as an internal dispute, a domestic dispute rather than invading another sovereign country. If the CCP does something illegal, it doesn't get punished. And then they'll do something even more illegal and just doesn't get punished. Fortunately, what the US is doing now is something very important. They're in talks to build a military port in the northern island of the Philippines. U.S. military involvement in the proposed port in the Batanes Islands, which sits just less than 200 kilometers, or about 125 miles from Taiwan, will help to decrease the response time of China's invasion of Taiwan, but more importantly, increasing the resistance against China's territorial claims. And this new tin dash line should actually be challenged by every country, including the U.S. and those around the South China Sea. If not, the CCP will simply use it to justify its illegal activities, such as fishing in other countries' economic zones, putting up military bases on islands, and more. And so in the so-called standard map, what they've also done is lay claim to India and China's border dispute. Specifically, it's in the areas of Arunachal Pradesh and Aksai Chin region. India has come out protesting the claim as well. Now, these are areas currently being contested by both sides. So what the CCP is doing here is simply using maps to legitimize its own claims. But as I said, what the CCP does is just making up its own rules and uh, playing this game where everybody else is also participating, but not following the rules of the other players, who are basically following a standardized set by the officials, uh, which in this case is obviously the various regulations of global bodies. And lastly, the CCP also drew borders claiming part of Russia and China's border. And uh, this map here lays claim to the Great Usuri Island on the Amur River. And this area was supposedly settled back in 2008. What they're doing now is causing a lot of diplomatic tension. You might be wondering why would they do this? Well, very simple two folds. The first is the internal propaganda. The CCP always states that 9.6 million square kilometers, not one kilometer less. And that's their slogan, right? Every inch counts for their territory. And now they're claiming it's increased to 9.73 million and 4,230 square kilometers. Every kilometer counts. So imagine as a Chinese person, wow, my country is so good at expanding territories, ter uh, territories without even going to war. I mean, they're just going to protect the claim. It's narratives. The CCP, facing tremendous threats to its legitimacy and political stability, uses this outward expansion to rewrite their character arc from the villain to the savior, claiming the lost land for the Chinese people, building a savior persona. And that's why these CCP trolls can 
get offended so easily over everything. They always have something claiming their sovereignty uh, because of the Chinese Communist Party. It's like everything in the world belongs to China, belongs to the CCP. And so you have a massive number of people just ready to challenge your claim at any given time. Whether that's on the Indian border or on the Philippines or on the Taiwan issue, the CCP's internal propaganda creates these type of online trolls. And the second is their current diplomatic situation around the world. I mean, you think that normally if you keep pushing these border and area claims, you know, you're going to be offending other countries, right? But what's so odd is they're doing this knowing exactly what's going to happen. But uh, I think one detail tells us exactly why they're doing it. So Reuters reported that Xi Jinping will not be attending the G20 this month in India. Instead, he will send his yes man Li Chang, the current premier of China. Not sending anyone would signal his exit from a global organization, but right now showing up is also very, very awkward. So he took this opportunity to claim some land, claim some territories, not show up, and it seems like a very awkward situation. Another reason is Xi Jinping's fear for his personal safety, as he did in South Africa. During the first day of the BRICS summit, remember, Xi Jinping mysteriously disappeared during or for one of the business forum, only to return when he had to the next day. But this all comes as karma. Here's what's happening. Now, compared to last year's meeting in Bali, Indonesia, uh, since then, the situation around China has rapidly deteriorated with the diplomatic crisis uh, with other countries. Now, this year, the CCP introduced counter-spying laws that directly target foreign companies. Essentially, it destroyed the business confidence that foreign countries have with China. Uh, sending their companies in would warn risks of it being investigated for alleged spying. And it's also rapidly forced Western countries to adopt de-risking with China, which basically means moving critical supply chains away from China. Now, the most critical reason I believe so why Xi Jinping is skipping is actually because of India, who will likely be the center of attention at this G20 summit, and partly because they are the host country, but also because they are the rising star in Asia. After the expansion of BRICS, it has essentially diluted China's influence. A lot of the countries that got incorporated into the BRICS Plus are actually India's friends. Now, India right now to the rest of the world stands as the upgraded version of China without the baggage. India itself is also seeking to be a dominating voice in Asia. And this is competing in all aspects against China. India wants to be the leader of the global south. And it has a democratic government, a similar if not more population, strong English skills, and arguably more growth opportunities. And China really fears this, right? If China is replaced, they're going to be isolated from manufacturing, ex exports, uh, essentially kicking them off of the economy chain around the world, going back to before 1980s. And it's jealousy of India. And that's why they're really petty about this. Now, India is the chair country this year for the G20, which means they're hosting the summit on September 9th in India. But at a recent G20 energy ministerial meeting, China was the only country that opposed India for the inclusion of Vasudeva Kudambakam as the G20 theme this year. And that's a Sanskrit phrase meaning the world is one family. It's something that Prime Minister Modi always says. And guess what the reason is? They say, the CCP says, it's not one of the six official languages of the United Nations. That's it? That's petty as heck. It's India hosting. They can use Sanskrit. I mean, last year when Indonesia hosted, uh, they used their own language and China didn't oppose it. So why India? Well, one Chinese article, I'm not sure if this is entirely satire or not, but they put it pretty perfectly. To put it bluntly, this is deliberately provoking China face to face. That's it, exactly it. The CCP is so petty that they pin the blame on India for provoking China by using Sanskrit. What? Only the brain dead CCP thinks this way. That same article actually alludes to the current state of the Chinese Communist Party. It reads here, on the other hand, it is India's lack of internal dominance that necessitates the creation of a long-term hypothetical enemy to bring the loose countries, meaning different countries, together, and China is the biggest imaginary enemy chosen by India. Hmm, that's very interesting. Isn't it China that always creates imaginary enemies to divert attention away from its lack of internal dominance? Hypothetical enemies like the United States, Japan, South Korea, the UK, India, and whoever else it's currently at odds with. And isn't it China that's banding together a bunch of so-called loose countries through the Belt and Road Initiative? It's just ironic that the CCP would cry about this. Such a tiny little thing. To us, but to them, it's a big deal. Now, just a day after the BRICS summit in South Africa, the CCP claimed that Modi's administration begged China for a meeting. 
Now, they always were like this, but I guess in reality, it's more likely that China requested the meeting. Now, a day later, Modi in an interview said that certain forces have taken advantage of debt crises in other countries, exploiting their vulnerabilities and pushing them into debt traps. And this is directly hinting at China's Belt and Road projects, which exploits debt-ridden countries by offering infrastructure loans, which traps them in these high debt uh, situations. And then a day later after that mean, uh, interview, India's Commerce Secretary Parush Goyal says, quote, my heart here is with Catherine Tai from the United States of America. Now, Catherine Tai is the US trade representative. So it's showing that India's real intention is to trade more with the US, and the relationship is skewing towards the US rather than China. India is clearly winning the diplomatic game in Asia, and they're gaining control of BRICS, if not abandoning it. It's working closer with the US and the rest of the countries that have democratic systems. And they want to appeal to a wider audience, just without the authoritarian or the totalitarian communist format attached to them. And this tells us how exactly why BRICS is an awkward uh, state right now. Because India and China are so different on so many layers that uh, you know, there's the government, diplomatic relations, trade, technology, uh, border disputes. A lot of these things don't sit well with Xi Jinping. And that's why he's not going to the G20 summit. And at the BRICS summit, we've seen something, which is that India isn't ready to sit around and let China still dominate what's happening with the BRICS or any of its uh, Asian countries' partnerships. Because India isn't the only one who wants to you know, be friends with uh, the rest of the world. And China is just pushing everything away from itself. right? It's alienating itself. Now, at the G20, India is also not the only country that has an awkward relationship with China. Of the G20 countries, which include the BRICS countries, uh, more than half of those nations have problems with China. Now, they either have territorial problems like you know, India and Indonesia, or they have economic problems with China, like Australia or the US. Or they have a narrative problem with China, like Canada's Justin Trudeau, who last time they met in, at the G20 summit, uh, got an on-camera um public shame session from Xi Jinping. And that didn't go really well. Now, either way, it's awkwardness all around with Xi Jinping, and that's why he's not going. All right, that's it today on the episode as to why China is claiming so many more territories and lanes and dashed lines and why Xi Jinping isn't going to uh, India for the G20 summit. If you enjoyed the content so far, make sure to leave a like, comment below your thoughts, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. All right, until next time, I'm David Zhang. This is China Insider.